everyone. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with your host, Eric. Um, Garden Fork is a very eclectic cooking, gardening, DIY, home improvement show and YouTube channel. And today I have my friend Noreen. She has a YouTube channel called Noreen's Kitchen. Noreen and I kind of have grown up together, even though we're adults already, but we've grown up together on YouTube. And then we have a very similar audience, I think. And I recently did a video about making um, a corn pone, which is a cornbread. Got a huge amount of comments, and uh, I immediately thought that Noreen should be on the show to talk about cornmeal and cornbread. So, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I did love your video, and I love, you know, because I always try and show people when I mess up too. And but you didn't really mess up, but I knew exactly what you did wrong. But uh, <laughs> and you but let I'm me really know. glad to be here. I've been, uh, we've been talked in a while, so it's fun. No, well, I kind of, you know, it's a vicarious experience for me because I'm like, oh, what's Noreen making this week? And then um, I went back through your channel and I watched the uh, chili with some uh, cornbread dumplings earlier oh, yeah. today. And then I just wanted to make them. And I'm like, I just had lunch, but now I want to make these chili with cornmeal, dump cornbread dumplings. And what I thought about with that was that you're, you're essentially steaming the dumpling on top of the stew. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. And yeah, then I, and my only thought delicious. was you could you could hit them with a propane torch or run them under the broiler. If you want to get them a little bit darker and crispier on the top, you sure could do that. If you did yeah. it in a like in a skillet, you could do that. There you go. Well, yeah. let's let's move on to the skillet because I I I made this recipe for corn, which is corn pone, which is a what what I, is that like an ancient cornbread? Is that a old school cornbread? What do you think? Well, I think that that probably is something that's coming out of our history with um, the African Americans. I think I can't be certain, but I think that that's probably where that terminology is coming from. Um, but pone is basically any sort of batter <clears throat> that's going to be cooked into like a porridge or in your case, a cornbread of sorts. Um, it isn't really, uh, cause I did notice that, um, Miss Vivian's recipe is, uh, it has no leavening in it whatsoever. Yeah. So it's not going to rise. It's going to remain pretty flat. Um, and I, I don't really know the, the history behind that terminology, but that's my best guess. I'm going to sound like I'm knowing what I'm talking about. Well, full disclosure, you you do live in North Carolina, which is quite a bit more south than I am. So. I do. I actually, um, now you took that recipe from uh, Vivian Howard's cookbook, uh, Deep Run Roots, which is one of my favorite cookbooks. I got it for Christmas year before last. Oh, great. And it's, it's just one of those cookbooks that is it's not only uh, full of great recipes, but you really could, she, you know, she put her whole heart and soul into that book. Um, it's like one of her children. And I'm a huge fan of her show, um, A Chef's Life, and have not missed an episode. Um, now, as you said, I do live in eastern North Carolina. I actually live about 45 minutes from her restaurant, The Chef, the chef and the Farmer, and oh, wow. have not had the pleasure of eating there yet, but hope to one day. Um, she and her husband, Ben, are busy. They are opening a bakery and a pizzeria in Wilmington, um, which is about um, an hour and a half, two hours away from where I live. And so we'll, we are going to be going to check those out as well. But... Um, but her cookbook is so incredible. Um, when you, you don't just get a recipe that says, here's a recipe for corn pone. It's the whole, it envelops you in her whole experience of this is what I grew up making. This is how my mom did it. And this is the whole history behind why we eat it where I live. And I love that. That to me is like, that's just gold. Yeah, since I don't read the newspaper anymore because it's so depressing, um, I read I read books at breakfast, mm -hmm. and I've been reading uh, the Deep Run Roots Deep um, the book yeah, the cookbook we're talking sure. about um, uh, when I have my breakfast, and the stories are are half the book, and there's just. I'm not a very good writer. I just kind of blurt stuff out with a keyboard, and she clearly. Um, 
it's just a ton of work, but it's a, it's, 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 it's kind of a lens into that area of North Carolina. And, um, it's amazing. It, it really is. Uh, the place where I live, which is Eastern North Carolina is really, um, it's very unique as far as you, my husband and I, we moved here from Northern Arizona 11 years ago, seven and a half. And, um, you know, very often we will say we live in a culinary wasteland, <laughs> um, which is kind of sad. Now you live in New York city, which is not a culinary wasteland, which yeah, is very, very different. <laughs> you, your fingertips, you have just about any cuisine that you could ever imagine. And, I have a lot of different cuisines at my disposal, but I live in a pretty rural area. And, um, you know, the what you're going to get here, because we live really close to the coast, you're going to get a lot of what we call down east um, food, which is really kind of um, farmer, peasant, kind of hearty pretty much not always that great for you food, but really delicious stuff. Yeah. You know, we live in, in pork country. We live in, in a place where we're surrounded by pig farms and chicken farms. And so we've got a lot of that going on and, and corn fields and cotton fields, soybean and tobacco. So, um, you know, you've never seen anything so beautiful as when you're driving down the road and you see a field of potatoes in full bloom. It's amazing. You know, so it's just, it's just one of those things, but, but corn is king, you know, and it's not just king here. It's really king in just about every cuisine in the universe. Um, corn is very pervasive. So, you know, that corn pone that you made, even though, you may, you may think you didn't make it right, but it was still delicious. I it know. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I have no doubt because anytime you make cornbread, it's going to be good anyway. Um, and I invented the word, the phrase corn forward. It's a very corn forward food. It is because it's very <laughs> corny tasting. It's, all, it's, it's, very, it's corn and water. <laughs> yeah. It's very corn. It's, it's pure. It's a pure corn taste. And if you use really good quality cornmeal and you know that you did, um, then you're going to get that. It's, it's just very pure uh, flavor, which is different from eating like a bowl of corn niblets, you know. Yeah. Um, but cornmeal is just something, um, it's so versatile now, and important. I really think it's it's really important as far as culinary history goes. So, It's interesting in the... Um in the comments on, there was 130 comments on the video so far wow. and two different people mentioned, and then I saw this, I rewatch actually A Chef's Life on the PBS app on my Apple TV because I'm a PBS, mm -hmm. I'm a PBS contributor so that you can watch the oh, back sure. episodes, five bucks a month and you can watch everything on their app. Nice. Uh, shameless plug for them. But, um, and then I watched the cor a cornbread episode of A Chef's Life and they went to the grocery store and there is more than one kind of cornmeal there. And then there's also cornmeal, there's self-rising cornmeal, which I've mm -hmm. never seen before. Yep. And really all that is, is like any, like if you buy self-rising flour, which I never buy, it's just a personal preference. It's just cornmeal or flour that has baking powder added in and sometimes salt. Um, I just don't like buying it that way because I already have that on my shelf anyway. And I know that it's fresh. If you buy it on the grocery store shelf, sometimes it may not be as fresh and and you definitely don't want to use self-rising in what you made, which is the corn pone. But interesting, yeah, because up up north here, um self-rising flour is almost non-existent. I mean, maybe bisquick is the uh exception there. You know, it looks like the flour wow. that comes in a cereal box. Yeah, people love self-rising flour down here. And I'm kind of like, why? I don't get it. Um, Just what they were raised on. And that's that's it. And then um, down here, is, well, in the South in general, white lily flour is really, you know, like my flower of choice is King Arthur flour. But, you know, I was born and raised until I was 11 in New Jersey. So, Yay. you know, King Arthur flour is really pervasive in, you know, the, um, the Northeast and uh, down here in the Southeast, it's the white lily is the flower of choice. Um, and then there are so many, uh, grist mills and corn mills down here in this area. You can, you can throw a rock and hit one mostly and 
they all have their own. You can go to the corn, the the grist mill, and and buy your cornmeal and your your fish breader and cornmeal mix, what have you. I was going to ask about that whether they have um, mills down there or not because yep. they they don't have them up here. But it's yeah. funny about white lily flower. Um, uh, us obnoxious New Yorkers will actually buy white lily flower on Amazon for about twenty bucks a five pound bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I actually, my brother, um, he lives in, in, uh, New Mexico and I grew up in Arizona from the time I was 11. Um, and my, uh, he is married. My sister-in-law is Navajo and, and they, you know, I don't know if you know about Navajo fry bread. No, I don't. But, oh, Navajo fry bread. I'm going to be making that on my channel um, sometime soon. But Navajo fry bread is really just basically fried dough. But they make it into a Navajo taco. Sometimes you eat it plain with um, with just honey uh, and butter. But then if you make a Navajo taco, it's got all the taco fixins and beans on top of it. But it's this delicious puffy dough that's fried and amazing. And when you make... Navajo fry bread, you have to have bluebird flour, which is very specific. It is milled from and comes from New Mexico. Wow. And I I hear you with the white lily flour from Amazon because I bought bluebird <laughs> flour from Amazon and paid about $20 for a five pound bag. So I totally get it. I get it. That's funny because we were trying to be authentic. So a buddy of mine is from the Carolinas and we were going to make these biscuits and he said, we have to have white lily flower. And I was like, all right. <laughs> and it was expensive. It is expensive and you really don't need it, but you know, you want to kind of have the experience. So I, I understand. So what's the contra the controversy? Well, I don't know, the point of discussion on a lot of people is with cornbread is the um, addition of sugar. And it seems like a Mason Dixon line kind of thing. Um, Northerners oh, yeah. use sugar and the Southerners don't. Is that Yes, that's very true. And a lot of times Northerners will use um, sour milk or buttermilk and Southerners will oftentimes use either plain milk or water. Um, and I think also um, there's that whole butter bacon fat kind of thing. Yep. Um, I think really, I, and I think it is a Mason Dixon line kind of thing. Um, I personally prefer Northern style cornbread. I like my cornbread to be like sweet and cakey. <laughs> That's just me. You heard it here. Um, <laughs> right? I do. <laughs> but I don't dislike Southern style cornbread. It's just a different animal. It's it's not as fluffy and it's very corny and it, it's almost cr – it's crispier for sure. Um, it, it's just different. It's so it's not a bad thing. It's just different. It's kind of like, um, in the, in North Carolina, the barbecue, uh, from town to town is vastly oh, yeah. different. Well, you, you know, you don't, uh, people have, um, had feuds about barbecue down here. Now, <laughs> having been a transplant to North Carolina, both my girls really love North Carolina barbecue, which has a vinegar based sauce. Yes. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I never been to a pig picking that I didn't enjoy, but I do not partake of the pig with the vinegar sauce because that is just not my favorite thing. Yeah. Um, I prefer a Texas style or St. Louis style barbecue sauce or Memphis style, which is, you know, sticky and sweet. That's just my my preference. But the people down here love their vinegar sauce and they just load it up. A lot of times when you get barbecue, like if you go to King's Famous Barbecue, which is not too far from where I live, you go in there and you order your barbecue sandwich and it comes, um, you know, with the pulled pork and the coleslaw. And then you load up your sandwich with that vinegar sauce to the degree that you prefer. Yeah, I've I've actually been I well actually several of my family members now live in North Carolina, so I've been oh. to different little hole in the wall barbecue places. Sure. And uh, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like diners. They're, they're sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. But it seems like the eastern portion of the state is more vinegar based, and the western part of the state um, tilts more to a, a tomato base and maybe a little sweeter base in their sauce. Yes, I agree with that. I do. Um, 
The vinegar sauce is generally hot sauce and apple cider vinegar. And there's sometimes there's some like um, sweetener in there. It just depends. It de- it honestly depends on the pit master and how they're making their particular sauce. But it's always going to have vinegar. And it's always going to have hot sauce. Hey, real quick, everyone. If you do any online shopping at Amazon, would you consider checking out the Garden Fork shopping page store thing directly on Amazon. It's our own page in Amazon with interesting stuff that I think about, think might be useful. It's stuff that I have bought. Uh, if you just want to go to amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork, that takes you to our page and anything that you buy there, we do get a finder's fee for and anything that you subsequently purchase during your shopping experience on the site, we get a finder's fee for, but that's Amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. It's kind of the DIY gizmo stuff that I've bought and I like, and I have little comments about each product there as well. So let me know what you think. Amazon.com slash shop slash garden fork. Thanks. I have a fun comment I want to read from the, the YouTube video. Um, I've lived most of my adult life in the deep south in Mississippi, Louisiana. And it's not true. Oh, this is okay. It's not true. That people just don't. It's not true that people in the deep south don't like or make sweet cornbread. They do way more than you think. The romantic idea that Southerners don't use sugar in cornbread comes from a time long ago when they didn't have sugar, or a time long ago when they didn't have money for sugar. Darn near everyone I knew used sugar, and they were all born down here. But hey, cornbread without sugar makes a good story, and it's one more way to say, hey, look, we're not like you Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I love that comment, and I guarantee you that it is mostly true. I, I would guarantee that that is probably one of those necessity is the mother of invention kind of things, that when they didn't have sugar, they just didn't use it, because I'm sure that there was a, a lot of instances where – you know, poor or people didn't just, they couldn't use it because they didn't have it. Yeah. Refined sugar was not cheap uh, until recently, oh. basically. Absolutely true. And if you think about, you know, sugar was rationed there, you know, we had the civil war and then every war since sugar is rationed because we're using it for something else. So well, let's walk. Let's walk through the um, the. Let's walk through my video and all the snakes I the mistakes I made. But um, where where were the red flags that you saw in the in the process? And what's actually what's the ideal way to make a corn pone or a corn bread in a, in a skillet like that? Well, I think you did. You know, you mixed up the batter. That was all fine. But I think that you would have done better by putting the bacon fat in the skillet before you put it in the oven to preheat. Uh huh. That bacon fat's not going to really burn. And um, and then when you put the batter in it, then it would have sizzled. You could have put it right back in the oven. And I think that you would have had a bit of a better result. Um, That was really the only thing that I I noticed that I felt like it could have helped you out um, to have a better outcome. You were yelling back Um, at the YouTube I would never yell at the screen because you know what? We're all having our own experience. Um, but I, you know, I don't always comment on your videos, but I always watch them. And that's just the one thing I knew that heating up the, the bacon fat in the skillet and bringing it up to temperature together. And also, but you knew this, you left the pan out too long. Yeah. That's cause I was messing with the camera and everything. Yeah. I know. And you can't, you know, that's just one of those things. Live and learn. You still had yummy cornbread in the end. <laughs> yeah, I um the the Labradors were quite excited. <laughs> <laughs> and um and, so what uh bacon fat versus the butter, what do you, what's your take? Um well I use butter in mine, but I usually don't bake mine in a skillet. I have baked mine in a skillet and I have melted my butter in it like that, but there's really no substitute for the taste of bacon fat. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, really. Um, and then also sometimes down here, what they'll do is they'll put, um, cracklins in the cornbread. Um, and those are like 
Mm. Those are, those are fried pigskin pieces. Yeah. Um, and they're super crispy. And then when you bake them in the cornbread, they get less crispy, but they get a little bit of, they give the cornbread a little toothsomeness. Yep. And so it's, it's again, a completely different experience from you had a corn pone that you baked in the oven and then that would be called crackling cornbread. Oh, wow. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. So, so well, since we're on this, uh, Southern food traditions and, um, are there some other ones that stand out to you that's are in stark contrast to the North? Well, if we're sticking with the corn thing, you know, grits are huge down here. And in the North, it's really not a big deal. In the no. North, it's cream of wheat. You know, I like, I didn't like grits a whole lot when I first moved here, but then I found out that I wasn't making them the right way. And <clears throat> we went to a restaurant in the area and they showed me how they made their grits. And I've never made grits the same way again. Um, the, the trick is if you don't know how to make grits, then you really have no clue because when you make uh, cream of wheat, if that's the place where you're coming from, then cream of wheat is kind of like rice. It's kind of like two to one, right? Yep. The grain to the water, and then you're going to cook it and cream of wheat, you're going to cook it and stir it until it gets thick. Well, grits are five to one. Ooh. So you need five parts liquid to one part grits. And that's like, for me, that's the magic combination. Some people use four to one, but you find your happy place that you like best. <laughs> <clears throat> Pardon me. There's no reading the self-help guru. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true though. <laughs> the other secret is some people like grits that are only made with water. I am not one of those people. Yeah, that there is, were a number of commenters on the video about people using water versus milk, you know, and I thought I was being this true, you know, doing the true Southern recipe. And then these Southerners are like, we don't use water, we use milk. <laughs> right. And, you know, Vivian writes things from a very pure place, and that's how her mom made it. You know, it's just like when her mom makes uh, collard greens, she makes them the way her mom made them, even though she's, you know, a world trained chef. Um, so she going back to those roots, you know, that's where she goes back to. She goes back to her mama yeah, and, yeah. and that's how she makes things. That's how she tells you to make them because that's how she knows. Or she goes to Miss Lily, who I have a special place in my heart for. She's great. <coughs> what I, um, I mean, I also, I had kind of a not super similar life story, but I was raised, actually my family's from New York City, but I was raised in the Midwest. I was raised, raised in Wisconsin where I learned about camping and hunting and fishing and f cutting firewood, you know, and um, just doing all this outdoor hands-on stuff. And then we moved to Missouri, where I went to high school, and um, a little bit different, but it, more the South. And then three days out of college, I could not wait to get out of the Midwest, and I moved back <laughs> to New York City because I had a free place to live because my, my relatives still lived in the, in the Tri-City area there. So I could live for free. And I was the cool New Yorker guy, you know, and I would come back to my parents' house and bring the New York Times. And they were kind of tired of me. <laughs> oh, no. Just kind of being like the New Yorker, the obnoxious New Yorker. We're like, well, in New York, we do this, you know. And now that I have Garden Fork, I'm actually drawing on all those skills I learned in the Midwest right. to have my YouTube channel. And actually people kind of like, well, even in New Yorker, they're like, well, how do, you don't live in New York because I actually, I can speak a, a Midwestern language. I can, I can talk about rifles. I can talk about uh, snow blowers. I can talk about making maple syrup and it's because of my childhood. So I'm a lot more thankful now than I was when I was just, getting out of college and couldn't wait to get out of the place, you know, and that's similar happened with Vivian. She moved to New York, worked in restaurants and wanted nothing to do with her hometown, you know? Right. I, I happen to love that, you know, open of her show where she says, where I swore I would never go back. <laughs> and, uh, I love that because, you know, it just shows it's, it's just that defiant child that's still inside of every one of us is, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to leave and I am never, ever going to come back. And I'm never even going to look in the rearview mirror as I'm leaving. <laughs> and then we all return to our roots in some fashion, whether it is, 
you know, in what we do, what we share or where we live. We, you know, some of us may go back, but some of us, we always return to those roots in some way. Yeah, I'm very happy to have them because uh, I can't tell you how many of my friends in New York City don't know how to drive a car, don't have no idea how to drive a stick shift and don't no. know how to use a hammer. Yeah, see, those are skills everyone needs to know. <laughs> you know especially for the zombie apocalypse. So. Yeah, right? I mean, come on. Are you still watching, um, what's that show you like to watch with the, the zombies? The Walking Dead? Yeah. Yes. Okay, because I don't watch it, but I know you're a big fan, so... <laughs> I am. I have to say, I'm a little disappointed with the, how this season is is coming up. But, but you know, I, I made a commitment, and I'm in it for the long run. So, <laughs> it's all good. All right. Well, cool. Where is there is there anything else we need to touch on with uh, the disparity between northern and southern cooking and cornbread, or any other thoughts? I don't. No, I don't think so. I I think that we pretty much covered those. They're not, they're not like vast and it's not like, it's not like so esoteric and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's funny I mean, cause it's there. I, um, I actually read, a, I tried to read a bunch of articles before we talked about, you know, Southern versus Northern, uh, cornbread. And it seems like every food website is compelled to write an article about this. So <laughs> isn't that funny? I think that's funny. But like the commenter on your video said, you know, we use sugar in our cornbread, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's just. Honestly, I think what their comment was, was probably very true. And, you know, then I think all of those those opinions come out of somewhere where we go, well, I this is how much like Miss Vivian, this is how I grew up eating it. And this is the only way you should eat it. You know, it's kind of like that very, yeah, very um, opinionated uh, stance on something. This is how I grew up eating it. And this is how it's made. And there's, there's no question. <laughs> so this is the right way to do it. And like, I, my mom didn't make cornbread growing up. I'm, you know, I make my own cornbread, but so. Cool. Oh. Well, thanks for having the, thanks for taking the time. We have to do this more because, um, we do. And maybe when I start my podcast, you'll come and talk to me. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll totally help you set it up. And, um, if anyone has any questions for Noreen, you can send us an email. It's radio at gardenfork.tv, or you can find Noreen at Noreen's Kitchen on YouTube. Anywhere else, Noreen? Oh, I'm on YouTube at Noreen's Kitchen, as well as Facebook, Instagram. I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it very much. But Instagram and Facebook, um, you can find me as well at Noreen's Kitchen. And, you know, you can email me with any questions you might have, info at Noreen'sKitchen.com, and you can find my website at Noreen'sKitchen.com. Yay. All right, thank you.
Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Thank you.